Hello, everyone, wherever you may be joining us from. And just to ground us in today's panel, I want to start off with a quote by Audre Lorde, uh, which is, there is no such thing as a single issue struggle because we do not lead single issue lives. Ida is grounded in so many ways in many different movements, whether if that be transformative justice, healing justice, um, psych survivors, mad pride, disability justice, disability rights, prison abolition, and so many more. And I think today, as we talk about movement lineages and we talk about this important connection and an important place to start, we think more and more about where we are today when, when, when talking about what transformative mental health means, where we are today as we consider the, the state of disability and access in, in the United States and across the world. So with that being said, I'm gonna start up with introductions. And as we go in and think more about movement lineages, I, I think it's important to kind of say that everyone on this panel has been a part of various movements and kind of across generation. And I think there's a, there's a beauty to that and a sacredness to that that I just wanna highlight as well. I'm gonna ask speakers on the panel to share name, pronoun, brief intro, visual description, and then to respond to a question. And the question is, what lineages or histories are you bringing with you into this conversation? What social movements do you call home or belong to? And I'll start up with myself. My name is Vesper Moore. I use they, a, a pronouns, um, they, them pronouns, if you will. Uh, I am a mad activist. Uh, disability rights activist. Um, I come from the space, from the peer support space, uh, rep and as well as the psych survivor space, the mad pride space, and the disability rights space. A visual description of myself is I have shoulder length hair, uh, dark brown and black. I'm wearing a beaded necklace of a koana, and um, I am a mixed race indigenous person. I have a dark beard, uh, dark, dark brown, dark black beard. And I'm wearing a black v-neck t-shirt. And behind me, I have a lemon tree. So with that, I am going to then pass it to um, Celia, then Stephanie, then Sasha. So starting with Celia. Hi, Vesper. Hi, everyone. Uh, it's so great to be on this panel. Uh, thank you, Jesse and uh, Vesper and Sasha and Noah, everybody. Um, so I'm a psych psychiatric survivor. Thanks for putting it up. And uh, let me go to chat and put it in chat. Okay. In the movement for human rights, I'm currently the president of Mind Freedom International, a nonprofit organization united 100 sponsors and affiliate grassroots groups for the thousands of individual members to win human rights and alternatives. I also want to say that um, I'm founder of Surviving Race, the injustice um, of uh, disability and human rights. And uh, I did get an award for a uh, lifetime achievement award that was at the last alternatives in Boston, Mass. And recently at the Niaspis conference in September, I got the Sally Zinman. Well, I was one of the people who received the Sally Zinman lifetime achievement award. I'm very, very proud of that. She was one of our movement, movement leaders and a mentor to me and a friend. Um, my pronouns is she and her, and I'm wearing like a blue, you know, um, like a little sequence on my shirt. 
and I have my hair is long and it's brown. Um, and uh, I'm just happy to be here today. I don't have any other, <laughs> you know. Um, so thank you. Thank you, Celia. I'll pass it over to Stephanie. Thanks, Vesper. Hello, everyone. My name is Stephanie Lynn Kaufman Tukulu. I use they and she pronouns. Um, I am a uh, white, queer, non binary person of Ashkenazi Jewish and Boricua descent. Um, I identify as a multiply disabled, mad, neurodivergent person. I'm a peer supporter, care worker, doula, um, and I have been involved in anti carceral crisis response work, disability justice organizing, um, and psychiatric survivor organizing for informally over a decade now. Um, I am speaking to y'all from my office room wearing a very colorful pattern jacket, um, a necklace with some red, blue, and white beads. Um, I have some short blonde-ish hair um, with my headphones in and some chaotic notes on the wall behind me. Um, Vesper, are we answering the, that second question or are we just doing intros right now? Yes, I think it would be um, kind of important to maybe just kind of tie it in further. I mean, you, you had started with what movements, so maybe the second half. And I'll actually circle back to Celia maybe at the end to just engage more. Awesome. Um, yeah, so for me, um, thinking about different social locations, different um, lineages and histories that I'm bringing into this space um, in terms of my ancestral lineages, as I mentioned. Um, I have ancestors both um, colonized and colonizer um, from Polish Ashkenazi Jewish um, descent, folks who were fleeing um, the violence of the Holocaust, um, as well as folks in Puerto Rico, which was formerly known as Borican, um, and really thinking about um, yeah, I, a lot about the healers in my own lineages, um, coming from rabbis, coming from um, folks who tended to plants and gardens um, and made their own medicine. Um, I think a lot about the crazy and mad healers um, of chosen ancestry um, that I have learned from and worked with. Um, I think a lot about um, for me personally, I want to name and uplift and pay respect to the relationship that I have with um, indigenous communities in sub-Saharan Africa, specifically the Nguni uh, tribal lineages of the Zulu, Fosa, Swati, and Indibeli people, um, and the healing lineage of Kuzalanism, Zini Wamadota, which I know is a mouthful, so I'm going to put that in the chat. Um, okay. Other things. Yeah, I particularly want to honor those knowledge systems and the life-saving medicine and healing that I received as a patient and a student um, after being left for dead by US-based medical doctors, which is a whole nother uh, story and part of my being. Um, and yeah, the last thing I'll name is just being situated in disability justice spaces, learning from folks like Talila Lewis, Dustin Gibson, Leah Lakshmi, Piepsna, Samara Sinha. Um, I have these folks' names always written down, so I'm gonna put them in the chat. Um, in the mad liberation world, I wanna name Celia Brown, who's here, um, Kathy Flaherty, Leah Ida Harris, as folks whose work that I've learned from in the healing justice lineages, I want to name Kara Page, Susan Raffo, and Adaku Uta as folks that I have learned from. Um, I'm going to put a couple other folks in the chat for terms of spiritual work, ancestral work. I want to name Maladoma Some, my partner, Habisom Tunkulu, 
Lama Rod Owens, Kazu Haga, and Reverend Angel Kyoto Williams. And the last two folks I wanna bring into this space are Tony Morrison and Alexis Pauline Gums. And I'm gonna take a pause because I know these are a lot of names, um, but I think it's very, very important for us to be clear about who and where we learn from, naming our influences, our ancestors. And this is like life, life, lifelong work. I'm 27 and I'm still doing this lineage unfolding. Um, so thank you all for listening and I'm gonna pass it back over. Thank you, Stephanie. I'm gonna pass it over to Sasha. Sasha, you are still on mute. Thanks, man. Okay. Okay. <laughs> um, Stephanie, I'm just like blown away by, you know, you're like just laying down the, the, the lineage and ancestors, you know? I mean, I feel like being on this panel with you all, um, I feel like I'm somewhere in between you know, Celia and Stephanie. I, 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 this is the first time I've ever been on a panel to talk about lineage. Um, and so it makes me feel like I've, you know, I've been around for a while. I guess what I would name, so uh, Sasha Altman de Brule is my name. I'm in Oakland, California. Um, my visual description is that I'm a, you know, white Jewish looking guy sitting in a, sitting in a, in an office with a bunch of my lineage and books behind me. Um, I, um, if you listen closely, you can hear my children in the other room with my partner because it's three hours earlier and it's breakfast time. Um, I think the, what I would bring to this conversation is that, um, I've been doing a lot of reflecting on the fact that this year is the, the 20th anniversary of when me and my friends um, and, and a larger group of people started an organization called the Icarus Project. And the Icarus Project um, started off as a small group of people who were like me diagnosed with um, what gets called bipolar disorder. Um, and then it grew into a, a larger, you know, online movement. It was like a discussion forums and the, the times before social media. Um, when I think about lineage, you know, I, in some ways I feel like I was raised in New York City. I'm the, um, I'm the, the child of you know, people who were immigrants that came from other parts of the world. And I was raised as a, as a white person. There was like a, like a real disconnect in many ways between where I came from. And, um, you know, I had Jews on one side, Ashkenazi and Roman Yote Jews on one side and Irish Catholic on the other. And that turned me into a white, a white person um, who, didn't know, who didn't know a lot of my history. I found my sense of self and a sense of camaraderie and a sense of connection to the larger world as a teenager, as part of the, um, the anarchist squatter movement on the Lower East Side of Manhattan. And that's where I came of age in the punk rock scene and had a sense of myself as being part of something larger. Um, and I think one of the things that I gained from that being part of that kind of like wild scene was that a bunch of people who were seemingly really small could be connected could have like their stories could be important like I was I like I came of age in like this you know kind of wild scene where we really believed what we were doing was very important and I um I've taken that into my life and so 20 years after starting the Icarus project I feel a strong connection to all the people, like some of whom are on this, you know, on this call today, who participated in building, a, you know, a movement, which the Icarus Project doesn't even exist anymore, but it exists in other forms, like Ida, like as a, as a organization, like 
really grew out of the Icarus project. The Fireweed Collective grew out of the Icarus project. There's people doing all kinds of things that came from this, this, this old lineage, um, you know. And so, yeah, I noted I'm, I'm 47 years old. I'm 20 years older than Stephanie, who's like full of wisdom and, <laughs> and, um, and, you know, I feel like in many ways, I look forward to the rest of this conversation, but like a lot of the ways that we, the mistakes that we made are getting corrected by the, the younger folks who were, who were part of, you know, part of movements that I, I feel connected to. That's my thoughts on lineage. I have history. such, yeah, thank you. I, I, I have such an appreciation for, for all of this grounding and mm -hmm really getting a sense of where you are all coming from and how you're connected to this space. Um, so I just want to say ha home, which is a thank you um, in Taino, just to kind of ground us in that again. And Celia, I want to pass back to you kind of the second half of the first question, which is what social movements do you call home or belong to? What are some of the lineages, right? Okay. Um... Well, I have always been indirectly tied to the civil rights movement. And because my mom and my dad were in college in Tennessee and they were part of that. And my mother grew up in Jim Crow. And, you know, when we have conversations, she talks about it as if it's yesterday and how hard it was for her to deal with it, but she had my grandfather really taught her to, you know, be positive about herself, be confident. This is the law of the land. There's nothing she could do about it, but that she should always, um, you know, be proud of who she is. And um, I just can't even imagine living then, but, you know, in some ways we're living it now. Um, so, and at the kitchen table at dinner, my father was always giving me books on, you know, Martin Luther King, uh, Malcolm X, the Black Panthers. <laughs> so we were having these discussions about all of this because this wasn't really taught in school. And he wanted us to be well-grounded. He wanted to un us to understand our history. And I'm really thankful for that. Um, I found myself, uh, found who I am in the psychiatric survivor movement. Uh, I never really felt a part of, always felt different with my friends growing up. I didn't feel the same. I didn't know why. I was hospitalized at 16. And so I, I didn't, and then everyone was really kind of stigmatized. Oh, she has mental illness, something's wrong with her. Um, and I just, I, I needed to feel myself and to feel different and not to feel the same as everybody else, whatever quote normal means. So I went through that and you know, I got to meet some really great people in our movement. Uh, you know, Judy Chamberlain, Sally Zinman, uh, Laura Van Tosh, we're really good friends to, to today. Um, uh, Leah Harris, her work she was doing uh, with Darby Penny and just great things she was doing. Um, Howie the Harp, I mean, I could go on and on and on, but it just made me know, it validated that it's okay for me to be different, okay? I, you, know, um, you know, I don't have to be just, you know, someone who has a mental illness and taking meds. I could be, you know, Celia, and I could be my mother's daughter and my and and uh, a sister, and I just really felt um, that that's what who I needed to be. I needed to to get into a, a space, consciousness raising, 
of who I'm going to be. And I think that's what the movement has done. I think a lot of people feel like the movement, um, is, and it is, it's about rights and self-determination, but it's also finding yourself. Who are you? You know, how, how do I take these concepts into my own life? And I think I learned a lot about that by just being in the movement, by just, you know, um, you know, just just viewing, just just observing what people are doing, because I didn't feel like I, I wasn't like, you know, uh, Harry to Harvard, Judy, I was learning from them. You know, and I also want to say I learned from Dick Gelman. A lot of people don't know he died early when I was doing the peer specialist project. I learned so much from him. And basically what he would say is your lived experience. Now they say that um, is valid and it can't be taken away just because clinicians don't understand it, you know. And not disrespecting clinicians, but just saying, hey, you know, my experience is important too. And I can see eye to eye with someone who's been through maybe similar things that I've been through. And that we can both help each other, not just me helping you and something's wrong with you, but something maybe I'm going through that I need your help. And that's very validating in, in peer support. So I'll stop there, Vesper. Thank you, Celia. I am so grateful to call you an elder and to have you in my life. Oh, I just wanted to say God, that in this moment. You. I never thought I'd be an elder, <laughs> but thank you. Thank you. And with that, I, I definitely want to kind of bring us into the space of this, this following question and statement and reflection, which is, what experiences, emotions, or events brought you to the work? Um, for example, rage, love, grief, solidarity. What has been the relationship between head and heart for you in that movement, in that movement work? And how, how has this changed over time? So thinking about how it's changed over time. And for myself, I can say, um, a lot of events had, had, had happened in my life. I was involuntarily hospitalized, institutionalized. Um, I feel very grounded in the statement, um, you know, quoting another, another great activist, Angela Davis, you know, um, prisons, prisons don't disappear social problems. They disappear people. And for me, I can say, something very similar of the psychiatric institution because prisons are by many different names. But for me, considering the psychiatric institution, I was very much disappeared. And I think as a brown indigenous mixed race person who's had their indigenous lineages in many ways disappeared, because when thinking about the Taino, we've been thought of as extinct and talked about in that way. I grew up with indigenous customs in the background of my life um, I, I, I grew up in places where I couldn't see the sunset and the full moon, right, where I was disconnected, where I didn't know where my water was coming from, my food was coming from, my relationship to what we know as nature and existence, um, and how emotionally distressing that is, right, and yet we blame so many different people in that, so for me, I'd say from, from head to heart, there's a lot of different relationships there. Um, particularly how it's changed over time is I think it started in a place of rage that was very much related to that grief. And now it comes from a place of, wow, I feel a lot of solidarity in this pain and a lot of beauty when I do find connection. And with that, I wanna start with Stephanie, if Stephanie's willing. And kind of share that question with the rest of the group. Thank you, Vesper. Um, ooh, I think that for me, 
there's like, you know, there's the what I thought at the time and then there's what it actually is, right? So I think what I thought at the time was these um, individual experiences of um, isolation, othering, that was grief presenting as rage and a whole series of emotionally dysregulated actions. Um, around the same point in my life, I had lost a friend to suicide. I was coming to terms with the impact of my own madness and the fact that I needed some kind of help um, or I would implode. Um, my first experiences with sexual violence, with psychiatric violence and lifelong abuse within the medical system. So those are things that manifested individually, but underneath that, now looking back, um, the impetus was there from my birth, the byproduct of intergenerational trauma, also intergenerational resilience and survival. But particularly when I look at like my life, my family unit, I see the ways that, um, a culture of whiteness, cultural loss, assimilation, genocide created the conditions within my family unit um, where, you know, I was making sense of my experiences in an individual way that was very disconnected from this larger story, this larger collective story. Um, and so really coming into it right from a level of that personal experiences, these things are happening to me, which is something I talk about a lot now that we don't necessarily need that um, to be able to um, be comrades, to be doing the right work. We don't need to, for example, wait until we become disabled to have an understanding of what disability is, our implications in perpetuating ableism. Um, so that's kind of one thing I think I showed up um, with a lot of anger and not knowing what was underneath that. Um, and I would say that that's an example of that disconnect between head and heart, right? Um, and we can, again, think about the disconnect between head and heart on a, in my individual body and then the dynamics of what it looks like when we have, when we move from the separation of head and heart of the land, right? Head and heart between how we are in relationship it makes sense that I might have a dissociated experience within my own body mind for survival, um, for whatever reason. So for myself, I think I've always felt like my heart was leading the work um, where I feel, where I move. Um, but I, I do believe that there were aspects of that where I didn't, I didn't know what was being communicated. I was just moving and making choices and being impulsive and reacting. Um, and I think that I wanna just name that I have a lot of grace for myself in that. I think there's a lot of talk about, oh, we need to come back into our bodies. Yes, and there's a lot of, there's a lot that happens um, when we keep that separation and why that separation exists. And I think that that kind of leads me to a place of hearing so many folks saying, well, you know, un unhealed people can't do this work, right? We need to heal ourselves first and then we can do the work. I don't, I don't believe that. I think unhealed people can and should be doing the work, but we need to be in community and we need to be accountable to each other because that's when we are capable of perpetuating trauma, oppressive dynamics, which I think we've seen in movement spaces where social movements start to implode because we are, we don't have other um, ways of visioning what our relationships look like. So we replicate those oppressive dynamics and watch our social movements crumble. Um, so I think for me, small things I've done to shift that over time has been um, something I've heard, I don't know from who, but this kind of mantra of like cleaning up my corner of the universe, focusing on my head heart connection in, in smaller doses and ways that I can. And also just moving into a space of knowing that there's a place for my rage, but it is not, it cannot be the only fuel that moves me forward. Um, so I'm going to pass it off there. Excellent. Thank you. And so I'm going to say, just leave it open, uh, Celia or Sasha, if 
you want to respond. You know, I'll, I'll start with echoing something that Celia said a few moments ago. She talked about growing up and, and never feeling like she really fit in, like she never really belonged with, with the people around her. Um, and so when I think about experiences and events that brought me to the work that I do, I mean, I could go, I could think about my childhood, but really like the, the dramatic event, um, you know, was getting locked up in a psychiatric hospital when I was 18 and diagnosed with manic depression. Um, how that was made sense of at the time had a lot to do with the politics and the, the way that, you know, the biomedical system was situated. It was like the early 1990s. And so, you know, I was straight up told I had a biological brain disease. And like Stephanie, you know, I had a really intense pressure cooker of a home environment that wasn't, it like wasn't even talked about. It was like, oh, no, no, you're, you're just, you're just mentally ill. And it took a lot of years to unravel. I mean, when I think about it, you know, the, the, the event, which, which recurred a number of times in my life was having what, what, you know, what gets called a psychotic breakdown, like a full on kind of breakdown where I, um, you know, at 18, it was like the sense that I, that the world was about to end and that I was being broadcast live on primetime television on all the channels. You know, I had this like vision of the end of the world and obviously that's crazy, but as a 47 year old man now who, you know, sits and, you know, talks to people all day, cause I'm a therapist. Like, I just see that that's like, the world is ending. And it does like, sometimes we get a little confused and we think that, you know, it's the world, but it's actually some part of us that's ending or there's so, you know, um, and I guess what I would bring into the conversation that feels the most useful is that in my work now as someone who still has this label and by the way, still takes psychiatric drugs, I've been taking lithium carbonate for 22 years. So on some level, I identify with this like, um, identity of bipolar, even if I reject it on some other level, the understanding, like Stephanie was just talking about, the idea that, you know, that it's some kind of individual in it, you know, illness is one way of looking at it, but we could also look at the, the people who, like us who get these diagnoses, who end up in hospitals, who end up getting forced to be put on meds and all that, as, as people who were sensitive and picking up what's going on around them. It just happened to be that I grew up in a, a family system that was very broken. And I took it all into me and became like the, you know, the one who took all the pain and it, and I cracked. And what I would say, and this in some ways goes back to the question of lineage, you know, when I, if I want, if I'm going to name lineage, I feel like the the um it, there are so many really useful fascinating creative ideas that emerged in the 1960s and 70s that were crushed in the 1980s with the rise of biopsychiatry and fam family systems like theory and all of the all of the, the work that was done the double bind theory of schizophrenia all of those ideas that really you don't even no one studies that stuff in school anymore i mean it really was like crushed out of us um i mean as a as a society a, you know a lot of that wisdom has come through in this really interesting form of therapy called internal family systems which i practice which is this idea that like 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 a family inside of each one of us we have a whole bunch of different parts that have relationships with each other and if we have the ability to be able to um, talk to those parts and understand that fundamentally there's like a part of us that is, uh, you know, whole, there's a whole lot of healing work that we can do. So I guess I would just bring that to the conversation because I think that that's like probably the most useful thing I could say in this context. Thank you for that, Sasha. And I mean, I'd say for myself, just, liberating ourselves in many different contexts right when stephanie's talking about like that spiritual work at home 
right? There's a liberation there. That's so important. When I think about what mad liberation actually is, right? For me, in a lot of ways, it's a conduit for, for much of the spiritual work, for much of the connection, for, for many of the things that I found in myself, you know, calling the name of ancestors, like, like my grandfather, Confessor, right? Like I call to him, even though he's dead. And people would assume that that's mad, but it's so liberatory and spiritual and connecting. And it's very grounding. And it's like, through this lens, through this medical lens, right? It is frowned upon that I'd call upon my ancestors. It is mad that I'd call upon my ancestors, but I find it liberatory. And with that, I wanna also share with Celia, you know, um, again, this question, what experiences emotions, uh, oh wait, I'm sorry. Uh, yes, what experiences emotions or events have brought you to this work, you know, the head and heart work? Well, I didn't want to be treated um, as if I was just a symbol or invisible or not a, a citizen of the world. Now, at the time, I was 16, 17. Um, but when I think about it, I, I wanted to be, I wanted to go into the hospital, heal understand me and leave and, and live a life. And it's never happened. And it really s s saddens me because, um, you know, I told myself when I get out, I'm gonna help myself, but I'm also gonna help other people <coughs> get out of that space that you could say, if you want to be diagnosed uh, bipolar, if that's who you are, that that should be okay. It shouldn't be, oh, oh you're bipolar, there's something wrong with you. And um, in spite of it, you are a person, you're a beautiful person, and you bring, bring so many gifts, <laughs> as Sasha used to say, dangerous gifts. <laughs> to uh, everyone uh, and it shouldn't, you shouldn't be defined. You should define who you are. So I came to that so I could heal, but I can also heal others. And it saddens me right now because we still, when things happen like in, in outside of us and someone says you have to be involuntarily committed, without even knowing you, without even knowing the circumstances or without even trying to get to know you, I find that to be a problem and it sets us all back. And um, it puts us in, or oh, we don't have to ask them um, for their opinion or shared decision-making because somehow they don't know what they're doing because they're acting strange, you know? And so the, it, it just, why don't we get to know people, know what's going on with them, instead of saying, oh, we don't understand it, so we're gonna lo lock you up in an emergency room. And um, it, just, it just bothers me, hurts me in a lot of levels, makes me angry, and then it helps me to continue to do this work. So thank you. Thank you. And I think with that, we can also just kind of consider like in movement work, movement work is really the uniting factor, I think for a lot of us um, in terms of community and connection. But uh, for me, when I think about what liberating our minds from carceral mental health um carcerality in our society like actually is it's it's in a lot of ways like as you see in the in, in, in the portrayed media like oh we're helping people you know this this progressive thought of like oh we will take people off of the streets and we will put them in institutions to help them right it's this it's this packaged idea of we know better than you it's sanism in a lot of ways. We know better because 
you can't control yourself. We're afraid of losing control. We're afraid of family members losing control. When in fact, it's like, how do we understand our relationship with control and many other different respects? And that's something I've been thinking about a lot. You know, when we talk about um, flowing through and honoring different states of emotion and being, right? Like there's, there's so much there. Um, but with that, I wanna to move to this question, which is what did these movements look like when you were first introduced to them? What, what were you fighting for? And has it changed? What do they look like now? You know, when I first came into uh, this movement, I was very much introduced through peer support workforce, which is interesting to me because peer support is such a restorative idea that um, is an indigenous idea, right? In a lot of respects of connection and centering connection, but um, it was brought into the market through capitalism and then vastly reproduced, right? And then that's how I got introduced to liberatory movement and spaces. So I had to really unwork a lot of that too. And that was super important, just, just in my own journey. Uh, what's changed over time is, is I think more people are naming psych survivors and naming mad pride and mad liberation where that was not as prevalent, right? When, when thinking uh, 2015, right? Uh, at at that time of 2015, I was hearing a lot of like lived experience, right? Lived experience advocates, lived experience space, life experience. And I'm like, sure, life experience, but let's name it. <laughs> let's name the actual lineages here, which are mad pride. Let's name lineages of psych survivors and, and uh, you know, breaking through the institutions that both exist physically and, and in different manifested spaces, right? So um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna ask that question again, like what did these movements look like when you first joined and were first introduced to them? Uh, what, what were you fighting for and has it changed? And what do they look like now? And I'm gonna start um, with Celia first and then kind of open the question to the rest of the panel. Um. Can you ask the question again? I'm sorry. That's fine. What did these movements look like when you were first introduced to them? So you mentioned a little bit of that earlier and what were you fighting for and has it changed? What do they look like now? Well, when I first got into it, to me, it looked very radical because most of my peers or survivors were a part of the system and I was a part of the system. And um, I was like, wow, we can have alternatives. We can do consciousness raising to support who we really are. And you know, we don't have to, you know, we can't, I, I, what I was thinking is we can't change the system, but we can change people in the system. And I could change myself and I can work on myself, which is no easy um, thing to do because you want the system to reflect how you're feeling. You know, you want the system to say, oh, well, Celia's healing, let's support her in doing that. And that didn't always happen. Sometimes it did, but other times it just was like, I don't understand what you're going through. So I had to find, the movement to help me get through that. And it was, you know, it, it was done by conversations, by reading all these wonderful books that we all have written um, to get to the space where I could heal and I could have rights, you know, know what my rights are. Um, so, I think it's changed a lot because I think the movement has changed a lot of what we're doing now. And it's not always rewarded because it's seen as radical, but you know, we have the recovery movement, we have peer support, all of that is great to have. So I, I see that it moved on to that. 
but I don't know what it's doing now. And so when I listen to you, Vesper, uh, Stephanie and Sasha, you know, I'm thinking about mad justice, mad love and things that I never would say, but that, you know, there's umbrella that we all could be under. And I think before the movement was just sort of separate in order for us to reach a point where we all could heal and we all could, you know, be energized by the fight. Because, you know, doing movement work does energize you, but you need support in, to, in maintaining it. So I would, I would leave it at that. Thank you. I appreciate Thank you. I appreciate you naming that like need for interdependence, right? And then that's really where peer support comes from, right? Is us supporting each other. And with that, I do want to open the question up to, to Sasha and Stephanie. Maybe we can go in order, generational order. <laughs> so, I, I mean, there's so much that could be said here, but one of the things that when I think about when I first came around, when I was trying to first find my people in the MAD movement, I think one of the things that the Icarus Project did that, you know, just wasn't, wasn't being done at the time was that we, we very explicitly created a space where we said, um, if you take psychiatric drugs or you don't take psychiatric drugs, you're welcome to be a part of our community. And if you use diagnostic categories like schizophrenia or bipolar disorder, or you think those categories are bullshit, you're welcome to be a part of our community. And that at the time was a big deal, I think, because in many ways, like there was a generational thing going on. At this point, I'm like old, but at that point I was in, I was, I was actually Stephanie's age when, when we started the Icarus project. And, and like, there was this older movement of people who, you know, in some ways, I mean, it's a historical thing too. Like the, we, like a lot of the people who were finding us were not people who had been in long-term psychiatric hospitalization. They'd been drugged and, you know, they had been, you know, and that were trying to like make sense of their experiences. And so we created a space for it. And, and I would say that in many ways, the way we framed it at least was we said, um, you know, we are, we, are, we are trying to change the language and culture of what gets called mental health and mental illness. And we were less, we were talking about forced hospitalization. I mean, those conversations were happening, but I feel like the dominant conversation was like, how do we reframe the whole way we're talking about this stuff so that there's like space for a whole lot more people to be involved. And so I guess that's what I would, that's what I would say. That's what I would add to the conversation. Yeah, I appreciate that. Um, as the baby of the room, I will say that when I was first really like around 13 years old, well, I'll say that I was not introduced to like the psych survivor movement or mad liberation in and of itself. I was in um, disability spaces and then learned about bad liberation after years um, of like existing in that space. And I think that um, if you are not part of the right communities or following the right people on social media or accessing the right kind of resources or history, it's very, very easy for these things to be completely invisibilized. Particularly the history of psychiatric survivors gets um, erased and, and muddled over um, and in very unique ways um, that I think is worth looking at. But, you know, in terms of like first, I think, you know, I wasn't using, I was using language of stigma and awareness because that's what I was introduced to at first. And I think that's still um, the case in a lot of different ways. Um, things have, it, and it depends where, where you're situated, right? Um, I've seen a lot of progress in moving from conversations of raising awareness and stigma towards ableism, towards sanism. Um, but 
you know, still again, you know, we can see in maybe other organizing communities or um, identity-based communities where there is that really, um, or a, a push for a more intense focus on structural dynamics, right? Whereas within mental health spaces, I think we still do see a lot of that individualization. There is that that narrative that Sasha's talking about that came with the proliferation of biomedical narratives that like mentally ill people are just like you. We're just a little sick sometimes, you know, I'm just it's like, I have diabetes. I just need to take my insulin. If I take my meds then I'm just like you. And I think that was where I was ushered in the like, acknowledge that you have a problem, deal with it. And you're just like everyone else. And it's fine. Um, whereas now like that's bullshit, even like the, you know, and this is another thing intergenerationally, like you have things that were really radical for a different generation that are not radical now because the container has changed. The environment has changed. Language has changed. So at one point I completely, when I look at the historical container of where the language of recovery came from, I get it. It makes sense when you have an entire narrative around these are, as Sasha said, you have a a, a brain disease that is what it is to be talking about no actually people move out of this and labeling that as recovery I understand how that's radical for me now I hate the language of recovery um what if I don't want to recover what if I just want to be mad like what if this is who I am and I'm not interested in medicating myself or assimilating into a neurotypical you know paradigm that's you know that's my where I'm situated um, I don't think we, we still don't have space for that um, because I've worked with, you know, some of the most radical abolitionists in, in, you know, prison abolitionists, for example. And then we start talking about people who experience altered states and psychosis. It's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. It was like, yeah, let's get rid of all the prisons and jails, but we need to keep one for those crazy people, right? Who, you know, lack insight and things. Um, so I think that it's like, we make progress in certain areas and then we go way back. Whereas some people might say, oh yeah, the stigma around depression has really decreased. Um, and when we look at what's happening with folks who are labeled with psychotic disorders, that has not changed. So are we you know, working to increase the humanity of certain subsets of people within our communities at the detriment of other folks who are um, living in body minds that are more othered and more pathologized, considered more dangerous, which again, exists at the intersection of race, class, um, et cetera. So, um, you know, that, and then I, the last thing I want to say is that one of the things that irritates me the most is situating like psychiatry and the mental health system as the, the thing that we have to like counteract, right? It's like, here's psychiatry, and then we had anti-psychiatry. What would it, or, you know, we have psychiatry and then the alternatives. What would it look like to not use that language and to actually just create and have systems of healing and care that don't even use psychiatry as the reference point, as the baseline, as the thing that we need to argue against? Because that's where I see so many of the problems that our imagination is completely contained by what we've been handed. And I don't want to only see anti-psychiatry. I want to see something that is not even referencing psychiatry at all because it doesn't need to. It's not a response to that. It's about what we actually want to be creating. Um, you know, that that's not just our, our reactionary, you know, this is how we, how we fight back. I want to be ahead, um, which is a lot of the work that I love doing with folks. So um, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop talking. <laughs> pause and pass. I want to also just like uplift a lot of what you said. I've been, you know, talking to a lot of different organizations around the world. Uh, and, you know, Friendship Bench in Zimbabwe has retired grandmothers who are trained in DBT and CBT sitting at benches and supporting their communities. Strong minds, you know, you have a lot of young adults supporting their, their communities. You have um, in India, Savath, India, which they're they're doing some some great community transformative work and the basis is not to counter psychiatry but rather its roots are in how do we support our community and work together 
I like to start there. I think that's so important. Um, and I think with that, Stephanie, there's a question I do want to ask you, you know, which is more like how has cross movement organizing moving beyond the silos of a single issue struggle impacted the work you do? Um, okay, yes, love being a crazy person because my brain is still going from the last question. I'm like talking to myself in my head. Okay, cross movement organizing, just a couple of thoughts there. I would say that, you know, there's a part of my neurodivergence, the way that my mind works, where I'm always looking at the bigger picture, everything I'm always zooming, zooming out. I've been like that since I'm a child. So I think there are ways in which I didn't look at the work that I was doing as siloed because it was just, that's what it was. Every time something happens, I'm thinking, okay, what would this look like for someone who has far less resources? What does this look like in all of these different ways? That's how my brain works. So, um, but I think, you know, that's, that's one part, but um, I first really started noticing the gap between mental health spaces and disability spaces. You have people labeled with mental illness, mad folks who think that being called disabled is the worst insult in the world. Um, and then disabled people who, you know, folks who have physical impairments, for example, who would engage in sanism to justify their value, right? Maybe saying something like, oh my God, you know, as a wheelchair user, so frustrating when people talk to me like I'm a child, like my brain works, right? You know, saying something like I have value, that's what you think you're saying. But what you're actually saying is I have more value than someone whose brain doesn't work, right? So that's why I should be spoken to with respect. That can be called like lateral ableism, right? Lateral sanism, where intercommunity folks were utilizing each other to form hierarchy of who's more valuable. Um, and again, this is a way that multiply marginalized folks unconsciously or consciously replicate oppressive dynamics within our own spaces. I think this happened for me the first time I was hospitalized in a psychiatric facility. I had this sense of like, I need to convince these people that I am, they made a mistake. I'm not supposed to be here. I'm not like the, you know, the other people who are loitering around this psych ward who X, Y, you know, and like, I have so much shame about that. Even talking about it now, I'm getting sweaty, my heart's racing, but I have to acknowledge that truth because I was a what, 14 year old kid who was in my, how do I survive this, right? All I know is, well, I need to do, I need to tell them you know, that I'm, I'm smart and I do blah, 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 whatever. The way that, the, that we are forced to dehumanize ourselves and that we actively participate in the dehumanization of everyone else around us for safety, for survival, for whatever that looks like. So that's, you know, like moments where I recognized how I was participating in that, you know, first of all. Um, and yeah, I think, you know, those, those places really highlight for me the spots where our own conditioning and internalized oppression meet our idea of freedom or liberation, right? So, um, you know, many social movements who are not centering folks who are furthest on the margin will only be doing a very small fraction of the work and never actually getting to the root of the root of the root. Um, you know, and again, I want to be very clear that this is something reinforced by dominant society. So if I'm someone who's dealing with what I consider to be like a physical sickness and I'm trying to get my needs met, I'm in a medical system where I'm being told I need to prove it's real, prove it's real evidence. I need test results, right? So you can see the ways that we are always pitted against each other. Um, that's one thing. I think, you know, cross movement solidarity, um, we need to be showing up and making connections always between what is happening. Nothing is happening um, at random. What's happening in immigration detention facilities is happening in nursing facilities, in prisons, in psych wards. Um, we cross movement work has taught me to be flexible, to be willing to experiment. Um, sometimes we need to move money to groups. Sometimes if we have a 501c3 label, we can use that to help grassroots groups get money. Um, we can use our platforms to uplift things. We can change our program. I mean, sometimes it's more useful to offer people money directly than it is to offer another support group. Um, so I think, you know, in the summarizing that to say, 
um, the work, every liberation work is deeply, deeply inherently connected. And if we are not doing work in a connected vein, um, you know, we are not seeing something that deeply needs to be seen. We're not getting to the root of the root of the root. Thank you. It's, we have an extra 10 minutes that has been found. So I want to announce that, say that aloud. And I know um, some of you can only stay till 12, which is fine. But I do want to say, you know, for me, like, I felt like I unraveled the biomedical conspiracy, right? So like, when people were like, oh, you could identify as disabled, I was like, oh, this is a trap, right, at first, because I was already trapped by something, right? <laughs> I was trying to liberate myself from. And then, you know, social model of disability was like, oh, you know, like, awesome. Like, this is, this is exactly like, like, like what we need and in terms of cross movement solidarity so important right um i do want to say others can can reflect on this question i do have a question specifically for sasha to start off with next um but do, do, do any of the other panelists have like remarks or thoughts yes and then i have to go but this was a great conversation and very emotional for me i didn't think it would be <laughs> um I want to say what I have struggled with <coughs> um, is that we have people in our movement, and I want to um, piggyback on what Stephanie said, who are anti-psychiatry. And uh, no matter what you say or do, they're going to be who they are. And I kind of feel like people should feel the way they want to feel, but that doesn't mean that I have to feel that way. So <clears throat> I feel like fighting uh, psychiatry and pharmaceuticals is an upward battle. And it doesn't really get us anywhere because they have so much power. But I think the real power, Stephanie, is that we work together as community to fight that. I, I personally can't do it anymore do anti-psychiatry. I can only do what people want and, and help people, my brothers and sisters, and my ancestors, you know, taken out from them is to um, help others, you know, and to fight for their right to be. Fight for their right to be in this world is what I do all the time. And I do it through peer support. I do it through just saying words that empower people, <clears throat> even if they don't feel empowered. I just keep saying it like an affirmation to them. And eventually they will get it because I believe in people and I believe in our community. And the last thing I wanna say is that I'm going to need a glossary of all these different terms. <laughs> you know, mad pride. I, I think it's great. Disability justice, all of it. Maybe uh, three of you can help me with that. And I think the future is in um, us all working together as community. We can agree to disagree without, you know, tearing our heads off uh, because uh, all of us are love. We don't say love a lot, but, you know, I'm love, and I feel great to be loved by uh, all of you in any kind of way, and that we have to uplift our youth, the next generation. I'm not going to be here forever, and, you know, whatever mentorship or whatever I can do, and also if I can learn from young people, um, I, I want to do that. I, I want, I'm in... I'm in sort of like a learning community, you know, phase. <laughs> so I, I want to, to be there too. So I want to thank everyone here. Vesper, you're just always amazing. Sasha, you too. And Stephanie, thank you for your stories. And I appreciate it so much. So I'm going to let it continue, Vesper. Um, thanks, everyone. Take care. Thank you for joining us, Celia, and being in space with us. Okay.
Uh, and I, I know that there's so much in all these questions, but um, oh, Sasha, did you want to respond? Man, I see we got we got eight minutes, so why don't you talk and then I'll I'll talk after that. Well, I was going to ask our um, our next question. So if you want to respond to this one, then. all right. I just, I've, Stephanie, I'm just like, you know, I'm so honored that I get to just be on this panel with you. And, you know, in many ways, I feel like all I was going to add is that, you know, getting to work with Ida in the last few years and when, you know, being able to connect with organizations in different parts of the world and the power of the social model of disability has really, um, it, like, it's really helped me think about cross movement organizing and I feel like in order to be able to for people to be able to hear each other there's like a, a level of um, you know we like there it's hard to it's hard to hear other people when there's a lot of noise going on inside ourselves you know um, and so being able to like kind of recognize that noise and to, but like you know being able to have relationships with it so you can like do the real listening. I'm just, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm very humble. But you're gonna ask me a question, Vesper, or something about like, what, what's the question? I feel like I looked at it before this call. <laughs> it's a, it's, it, it's a powerful question that I think is important for for future organizing and us being in community together. And the question is, what have been the biggest challenges or pitfalls you've faced in movement work? What about your biggest discoveries and learnings? Wow. Um, there's been a lot. There's been a lot of, you know, there's like a lot of um, challenges or pitfalls. I mean, I think that don't ever try and, uh, it's like when you get a, in any movement, I mean, like, like Stephanie, it sounds like from the time I was 13, 14 years old, I was engaged in social justice activism, you know, and so like, I, I feel like one of the things, there's a lot of political movements out there where people are engaged um, and, and, and doing the work from their heart, doing the work because they really like, they feel really strongly about it. I feel like in the movement that I come from, the movement that we're talking about here, people are like, it's so coming out of their like, lived experience of being oppressed and being like being told that you're nothing and being told that you're crazy um that there's a lot of inner work that has to get done to be able to like shed a, a lot of that stuff and i've seen and participated in a lot of people just like tearing tearing each other apart in movements you know and really being like like horrible to each other just because like there's so much pain, like so much like un, unprocessed pain. And a lot of that stuff as, you know, as a cis white man who like stepped into a leadership role um, in the mad movement, there was a lot of things like as I, when I was younger, it was, it was hard for me to see my social location and see the, the ways that um, all the privileges and all the ways that I like, I took things for granted because of the things that I had, because, you know, they were just, they were just handed to me. And I think I see a lot of correctives, like in, I see that happening in different ways now, you know, but I feel like I participated, um, you know, I like, I hurt a lot of people. I was hurt by a lot of people because we didn't, we were like, we were fighting for change, but we didn't have the, um, you know, like I personally didn't have the humility to be able to understand ways that I was, I was like misusing power. Um, I think we see, I'm kind of stepped out in some ways, like in, in recent years, like I'm in a way more, I'm not doing a lot of like actively engaged, like public work. So I don't know what it looks like these days. Um, but I'd like to think that, um, you know, that my friends and I who were, having such a hard time with each other that like that a bunch of that you know that that strife has paved the way for better ways of doing things and i and and i would say that looking at the way that ida as an organization where like i'm not like i'm kind of on the sidelines of ida just kind of like being able to um you know 
help where I can, but I'm not in a leadership role at Ida. I see the leadership like, do, like really like creating spaces that are just a lot safer for people to be able to, to step up and naming the power dynamics and being explicitly clear about like, here are the, here are the ways that like we've created a space so that people can um, engage with each other. I don't know, it's a great question and I'm like, we got three minutes, so I'm, I'm gonna shut up now, but I'm grateful for, I'm grateful for, uh, you know, just to be able to be a part of this conversation. I'm honored to share space with you, Sasha, Celia, and, and Steph. Like, I just, this is so important. And I can tell you as a brown indigenous person in this like survivor movement space and the disability rights space, I feel othered often in movement spaces. There are many a time I don't feel like I belong in the same movement. And there's an importance in addressing that, right? And I think, you know, to our next question, which I want us to end on, hopefully with just some, some reflection in these last two minutes, you know, what are your hopes and dreams for the future of transformative mental health, mad liberation, and whatever language you may use to describe that? And for me, it's, it's a movement space that does truly center community healing, collectivism, us working together, honoring polyphony, many different perspectives, right? Many different truths. And uh, a space independent of psychiatry and the mental health industrial complex as much as human po humanly possible, where we organize around, you know, um, belief system and honor each other's identities. Um, so with that, I, you know, I want to open that to y'all within our last minute. What are some of your visions for the future? I can start. I think um, in like a very, very big, big picture way, I've kind of already alluded at this. I'm really interested in getting, diving really deeply into what we've decided collectively constitutes mental health care um you know in our in a u.s centric culture that has you know gone outwards around the world through various colonial technologies i think it's important to ask ourselves how and why we decided that mental health care looks like this it looks like therapy it looks like medication the way that we have delegitimized other um, healing modalities in the process of saying that this is what it looks like to treat or heal what we call mental illness. That is something that I would like to see um, creatively undone, um, that we don't continue to invest in what we know is not working. Um, we are reinvesting in having communities connect with our ancestral healing practices, um, increasing what our options are, um, and moving to a place where we actually find um, the value in madness. Um, you know, this is something for me that's really important that um, particularly I had a very intense altered state episode um, where when I came out of it, I found like 60, 70 pages of writing that I had done about how to manage psychotic episodes that it literally took me months to understand what I had even written. Um, and I use that in my work every day. Um, and so, you know, going again beyond the like, this is something neutral. Um, I think there's a very important uh, piece of this um, that Sasha alluded at, you know, people who feel too much, who think too much, who are too sensitive, um, understanding that we are vessels for oftentimes things that are much larger and bigger than ourselves. And I'm really interested um, in seeing not just making one story and one narrative for what is mental illness, why does it exist, but having a thousand different ways that we can understand what's happening to us, all are equal, valued, and have options for how we can support ourselves if that's the story that we believe at a moment in time. I think we can change our narratives, we can change how we think about ourselves, we can use pills, we cannot use pills, we can use pills for a short period of time. There are options. Um, and I'm just really excited to be part of a future where we can keep creating more of those. 
Thank you. Thank you all so much. That has been our panel session. There's so much to leave with and so much to think about. And um, I, I want us to just continue to think as a movement, you know, um, where can we grow together? Where can we move together? And where does mad liberation lie? Thank you. <laughs>